Friends, this is Tim Benal of BenalofAmerica.com with another edition of Benal of America Audio Season 2. It is November 25th, 2006, and this week the guest is Bart Sibrell, creator of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. And we're going to be talking about moon hoax theory. I've always been sort of a skeptic of the moon hoax theory. I'm not a, a big moon hoax theory enthusiast, but I do recognize its place in the world of the esoteric and always kind of thought it would be fun to have a moon hoax edition of Ben All of America Audio. So we went out and tracked down Bart Sabrell and got him on the show here so we can discuss moon hoax theory from top to bottom and inside and out. Amongst the various aspects of moon hoax theory we're going to be talking about include its history, where to come from. Bart's going to lay out his case for the theory. We're going to explore the three different subgroups within moon hoax theory and find out which one of those three that Bart subscribes to and why he does not give credence to the other two. We'll be talking about rumors of Stanley Kubrick being involved in the moon hoax, moon hoax theory's place in the world of the esoteric. I like to call it the bastard child of esoterica. We're going to talk about that perception problem facing moon hoax theory. And we got to talk about the Buzz Aldrin incident three years ago. Bart was punched in the face by Buzz Aldrin as he confronted him about the moon hoax theory. It was all caught on video. It made worldwide news. Now, three years later, Bart has some amazing reflections on the entire story, and he shares them with us here in the interview. Plus, of course, tons and tons more. It's moon hoax mania here on Ben All of America Audio this week. Stick around. It's going to be a wild one. Bart Sabrell's the guest. If you're unfamiliar with Bart Sabrell, let me give you a little bit of background on him. Bart Sabrell has been making movies for 20 years, during which time he has owned three television production companies and worked for two of the three major networks. His national credits include films for NBC, Fox, CNN, The Nashville Network, Lifetime, and BET. His top awards from the American Motion Picture Society include Best Cinematography and Best Editing. He's made four films about the moon hoax, and they are A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, Astronauts Gone Wild, Apollo 11 Post-Flight Press Conference, and Apollo 11 Monkey Business. You can find out more information on Bart Sabrell and his films at www.moonmovie.com. Without any further ado, let's rock and roll. This interview was recorded on September 21st, 2006. Bart Sabrell on Banal of America Audio Season 2. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Been All of America Audio. I want to welcome as our special guest this week, Bart Sebrell. He is the writer, producer, and director of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, also Astronauts Gone Wild, and he's got two other films, Apollo 11 Monkey Business and Apollo 11 Post-Flight Press Conference. These are all available on DVD, fantastic films. The website is moonmovie.com. Bart Sebrell is I'd say he's almost worldwide known as one of the biggest names in the moon hoax theory field. So, you know, we don't, I, I find moon hoax theory doesn't get enough coverage out there. Some people don't believe it. Some people uh, are very adamant about it one way or the other. And it's a very interesting topic. It's part of the esoteric field. I want to give fair representation to everything out there. And especially when you can get somebody like Bart C. Brell, who's uh, tops in the field of moon hoax research. So let's rock and roll and let's do it. Bart C. Brell, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim, for having me. Uh, let's start out first with your background, your bio, how you got into uh, what your life was like before you started uh, unearthing the moon hoax. Well, um, probably from the age of 8 to 14, I was one of the biggest fans of the moon missions. I had a whole bedroom wall uh, covered with pictures of the first moon landing. I thought it was the greatest thing. My father was in the Air Force. I constantly hung around aircraft and aircraft museums and things like that. Mm -hmm. I was a big fan of aviation, and to me, this was the greatest achievement of aviation. Yeah. And then when I was about 14 years old, I was watching a syndicated news magazine program, and they had on the show this gentleman who worked for the space program from about 1963 to 1968 during the development of the Apollo rocket. Yeah. 
And he asserted quite confidently that the moon missions were, number one, impossible, and then number two, falsified as a Cold War bluff to get the Soviets to thinking we were more advanced than we really were. Yeah. Well, at age 14, I'm pretty uh, open-minded still, and <laughs> so I, I think, oh, I never heard that before. I wasn't insulted or anything, and I, after the show, I went to my bedroom wall and started looking at the pictures, wondering, is this a Teldron studio or is it a real landscape? And sure enough, there were indicators that uh, made it look like a Teldron studio, like the foreground uh, would be one color and then the background would be another color, and they often changed colors left to right in a horizontal line. Sometimes, like the gentleman pointed out, uh, the shadows, which should always run parallel with one another if they're solely lit by the sun, as NASA claims, the sun being 92 million miles away and a million times bigger than the Earth, and no atmosphere on the moon, makes the lighting there about 20 times brighter than it would be on Earth in a desert. Oh, wow. So they have no need for flash photography or lighting kits. So all shadows, if you go outside, you know, at noon on a cloudless day, you'll notice that your shadow and your friend's shadow, they always run parallel with one another. They never intersect if they're lit by the sun. Well, in a couple of these pictures, you know, they intersect as much as 90 degrees. And you can see an example of this at moonmovie.com where, you know, we have 90 degree converging shadows and I'm a filmmaker. So my job as a filmmaker is to make fake scenes look real. Yeah. Well, 10 years after I saw this television program, and it's kind of been in the back of my head all this time, did we really go or did we not go? I became a filmmaker, and I was editing one day for the gentleman who actually produced that show 10 years earlier. Oh, wow. And I said, do you remember the guy who said we didn't go to the moon? No, but called the San Francisco office. I did. They said they were just days away from deleting all 10-year-old files. Oh, <laughs> so wow. I almost, almost didn't find the guy. And tracked him down, and he suggested that I do a film about it. So I started doing the research, you know, found out the thing about the shadows, and um, also found out that two of the three astronauts never give interviews, you know, two of the three. The first man who walks to the moon says no to everybody when they ask him for an interview. The, another guy on the, on the same mission always says no to interviews. You know, the only guy who talks about it on that first mission is Buzz Aldrin, who's had you know, some emotional problems everyone knows along the way. Then, uh, you know, Tricky Dick Nixon was president at the time. Then the administrator of NASA, James Webb, the highest ranking civilian employee of an alleged civilian program, resigns without explanation days before the first Apollo mission. And the Soviets, they launched the first satellite, the first animal, the first man, the first woman, the first spacewalk, the first crew of three, the first of two spacecraft at the same time. For every 100 hours we spent in space, they spent 500 hours. Wow. They were so much more advanced. Of course, this is during the Cold War, the nuclear scare, is Sputnik 3 going to have a nuclear missile on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it is, uh, you know, Kennedy, after the Soviets had launched the first satellite, the first animal, and then put their man up, the first time the Soviets put a man into space, he orbited the Earth 20 times. A few weeks later, desperate to try to do something, we put a man up, and he goes, I think, from the west coast or the east coast to the west coast and splashes down. Doesn't even orbit the Earth at one time. A few days later, Kennedy, who's a visionary, not a scientist, says, let's go to the moon before the end of the 60s, before December 31st, 1969. And they, of course, are claimed to have gone within 5% of that deadline. Well, I, I figure, you know, when he became a martyr, all of his goals, including – civil rights, legislation, all these things were, you know, passed through as a way of kind of honoring his memory. Well, he had made this great boast. He even said so, that he makes this boast in front of the world, in front of the Soviets, in front of the Americans, in front of the Chinese, that we will go to the moon. And America is a very prideful nation. And what happened, I believe, is during the Johnson's administration, they found out that they could not go to the moon. Uh, for a number of reasons. The rocket wasn't nearly large enough. Uh, there's radiation, the Van Allen radiation belt, which we can go into. And they started developing the scenario for faking going to the moon. The way I look at it, it's kind of like a poker game. Yeah. We've got uh, two twos and they've got three threes and we bet half a million to get them to back off. Mm -hmm. I also think that's one of the reasons why he didn't want for re-election is because he knew they were going to fake the moon landings. And who knew that would work? 
might work, might not work. You know, yeah. if it didn't work when you were in the seat of authority, boy, that would be something to be remembered by historically, wouldn't it? Yeah. And so he was only one of two incumbent presidents who did not run for reelection in the history of America. And I think that was largely the reason. Nixon came along. They inform him of this plan to uh, fake the moon landing six months after he's in the office. And apparently he gave his okie dokie because they did it. And what people have to understand, you know, going to the moon and orbiting the Earth are completely different in intricacy and difficulty. The space shuttle only goes as high above the Earth as Florida is wide. So if you had a globe, like a foot across, like in school, yeah. that would be about a half an inch above the globe. Oh, wow. The moon would be 30 globes away or 30 feet away. Wow. So what we're claiming is that they went 100,000% farther than the space shuttle has ever gone nearly four decades ago with less computing power than in my Walmart watch. <laughs> and the space shuttle going 200 miles above the Earth has already killed 14 people. And yet we're to believe that nearly four decades ago, with that much older technology and experience and ability, they went 250,000 miles away, six times, landed on another world, and never killed anybody. That they were able to go from a standstill on the moon to 4,000 miles an hour in a complete vacuum with no aerodynamic capability and perfectly synchronized with the command module, even though computers would just be incredibly slow. And I doubt seriously could make those calculations. And, you know, you have to wonder, why is it that we had such capability back then and we do not have the same capability now? You know, Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic in 1928. Do you think it would be 50 years before someone flew across the Atlantic again. Yeah. They're, they're saying we can return to the moon 50 years after going the first time. And their alleged new rocket is called Apollo on steroids, meaning the rocket that now that we need has to be so much bigger than the rocket we successfully went to the moon back then. You know, uh, the administration said some interesting things. He said, um, you know, maybe when we return to the moon, we can find stuff in the soil that we can use as fuel. Well, we were there six times. You know, I don't know that we're going to find anything new. Then they said um, going to the moon is a logical first step to Mars and beyond. Okay, then why do we need to repeat it a seventh time? Yeah. And he said, well, we need to be able to learn how to protect the astronauts from radiation. Well, just do it the same successful way you did it before. <laughs> Von Braun, who designed the rocket, originally said to make the you know to make it in one rocket to the moon, the rocket had to be taller than the Empire State Building and weigh eight hundred thousand tons. The rocket they used weighed no more than sixty five hundred tons. That's a difference of about thirty thousand percent. Wow. He said repeatedly, and every book you can find from the age, you have to have a space station built first before you can go to the moon. And you know what the administration says? Once we finish building the space station, then we'll be able to return to the moon. Well, then how did they get to the moon in the first place? And then that doesn't even mention the fact that there's this huge field of radiation starting at 1,000 miles up and extending 25,000 miles called the Van Allen Radiation Belt that no human has ever gone through except allegedly going to the moon. I mean, since 1972, no country, not the Soviet Union, not China, not Japan, not Great Britain, no one has ever claimed to set a human beyond Earth orbit. And, you know, we begin to wonder why, and I think it's because of this radiation field. Yeah. When the space shuttle went up to their highest altitude about 15 years ago, they were 350, I'm sorry, 650 miles below the beginning of the field of radiation. And the radiation was so severe, they could see it with their eyes closed, the sparks of light hitting the retinas of their closed eyes. Oh, wow. They descended to a lower altitude, and CNN issued a report that said, quote, the radiation belt surrounding the Earth is more dangerous than previously believed. Now, this is simply them getting up to 365 miles. So how can it be that they know the radiation belt better at 365 miles than they did when they went through it six times to the moon and back? Yeah. How can it be more dangerous than previously believed when 
you know, we, we went through it six times. People don't put this together. And what we have is this psychological predisposition to believing that the moon landings were authentic because we wanted to believe them. Yeah. So we, everyone wanted to believe it. Um, now, to backtrack a little bit, um, I'm sure you probably uh, know this sort of thing. How did the moon hoax theory even begin in the first place? Like you said, you saw this program um, when you were a kid. Uh, where where exactly did the the entire idea come from? Now I understand Bill Casing had some book that came out in '74 that was sort of the first real shot in the uh, moon hoax theory uh, canon, if you will. Um, tell me a little bit about the origins of the moon hoax theory. I'm sure you've heard. Well, about I would it. say he is definitely the you know grandfather of the moon landing hoax. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a Knight Ritter poll done in 1969. I think they polled probably 1,250 people, something like that. Uh, and at that time, there were 10% of Americans, you know, adults, holding down, you know, jobs that thought the moon landings were fake. They just somehow sensed that this was more than mankind could achieve. Yeah. You know, the general public was watching Star Trek and Beam Me Up, and they really didn't know that there was any difference between orbiting the Earth and going to the moon. I mean, most people probably don't even realize that the space shuttle only goes as high as Florida is wide. And they don't realize the great vast distance between that and the moon and the radiation belt and all this. I would say aside from there being 10% of the public who was skeptical right off the bat, Bill Casing and his book called We Never Went to the Moon uh, really – got the thing going, and his book inspired the film Capricorn One, which I believe was uh, released in 1978, and that was about a fake Mars landing. They didn't want to make a movie about a fake moon landing because that would be a little bit too offensive or deliberate or whatever. Yeah. So they made a film about a fake Mars landing. Interesting thing on the back of the sleeve, if you can find this film, Capricorn One, uh, is it boasts that it's the only space film in the history of filmmaking ever produced with the cooperation of NASA. Oh, wow. So, wait a minute. The only space film, not 2001 A Space Odyssey, not Star Wars, the only space film that NASA cooperated with, went out of their way to do anything with, was a film about a fake space mission. Well, I guess what they were doing is simply reverse psychology. I mean, what better way to diffuse this film than for them to welcome the crew with open arms and say, sure, you can shoot on our premises and shoot everything. It doesn't matter. Sure, you know, to try to diffuse it. It's just that America is so prideful and, you know, science in a way is a religion. I mean, scientists killed George Washington. He had a virus. He had a cold. And they said, well, we know best. We need to bleed that cold out of you. Well, just because someone is a scientist, that doesn't necessarily mean they know all that's going on. Yeah. So science, to me, is a religion. I mean, um, no scientist really wants to jump off the train and be a rebel and say, hey, I think we didn't go to the moon. People are psychologically predisposed to wanting to believe what the government tells them. If they say we went to the moon, I mean, who are we to doubt them? And to tell you the truth, we really didn't have a reason to doubt them aside from JFK. Mm-hmm. You know, why doubt it? I mean, it sounds so outrageous. The government faked the moon landing and all done in a television studio. I mean, it sounds kind of nutty. And, you know, one of the first questions that I came to mind was, you know, how can you fool all these people? You have 100,000 people working on the space program in all these departments. Well, the thing is department. Mentalized. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. The yeah. person who makes the glove, the door, and the boot, by the time they went on the rocket, you know, they were on the rocket. They went up, which was no small accomplishment, now or then. But once they went up, there were only three eyewitnesses of three government employees and a TV picture completely controlled by the federal government. And everyone else wanted to believe it. I mean, any scientist, no matter what degree, of science that they're in, they're kind of feeling their hearts that they're part of, you know, going to the moon, part of that great accomplishment, whether you're a mathematician or civil engineer or whatever, they kind of feel like that's, that's my club. We went to the moon trying to tell them otherwise. It's just, you know, trying to tell them that, well, their mother was an ax murderer before you were born. Did you know that? Like, no, no, no. She baked me cookies. No. And it's just, it's a real big psychological barrier to think that the government would be so wicked, so deceitful, so have such chutzpah, you know, to do such a thing. Yeah. Um, 
Now, from what I understand, there's, there seems to be some countries out there in the world uh, actually go along with the moon hoax theory as fact. Um, now, I'm not sure. Maybe you can clear this up. I, now, it says I've heard in various places Cuba and China both uh, teach that, the, that there was no moon landing, that it was fake. Is that true or is that just an urban legend? No, I think that is true. Uh, I think both of those both of those things are true. Um, faking the moon landings uh, was a, had multifaceted benefits. I guess number one, the main benefit was domestic. Uh, it employed a lot of people. It uh, was a great pep rally during the Vietnam War. I mean, second to the Civil War, I would say the Nixon administration had more civil unrest than at any other time in American history than, you know, of course, the revolution originally. Yeah. Uh, and this was just a, something to distract people, to give us something to take pride in, something good to feel America about, other than, you know, people dying in the Vietnam War and civil rights and economic, uh, upheaval. So there was that benefit. And I, and I suspect they really did want to fool the Soviets into thinking that we were more advanced than we really were. In 1994, the General Accounting Office revealed that the Star Wars Missile Defense Program rigged tests to make it seem more advanced than it really was. I'm quoting them. The aim was to fool the Soviet Union about U.S. strategic capability during the Cold War. So that was another reason to fool the Soviets during the Cold War into thinking we have equal or greater capability. Now, it is possible through espionage that the Soviet Union or China or Israel found out that we didn't go to the moon. And then, of course, there's another obvious question. Well, why didn't they just blurt it out? Well, if I had a picture of a president with a prostitute, I could give it to the media or I could ask him for $500 million. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think when, when, when and if these countries found out that the moon landings were fake, they thought that through. We could blurt it out, and then it'll be useless. Or we can blackmail each administration after each administration. Why does China, after they roll over their own people with tanks, get most favored nation trading status all the time? And other seemingly contradictory relationships with other countries. Yeah. I think th their espionage does. They did find out. They do know. And they're probably blackmailing the United States. Okay. Now, what do you say to uh, – you've, you've done a, a good, a really good case here for laying out the moon hoax theory. What do you say to uh, the critics, the skeptics of the moon hoax theory? Um, if anyone who's listened to Esoteric Radio as long as I have has heard the moon hoax debates uh, on various shows, I think even you've been a part of some of those, uh, where it's very often like tit for tat, you know, you say one thing and then they'll they'll sort of try and debunk it with their own take on the whole thing. Uh, what do you say to the people that are just as fastidious about the the details in this thing as you are and say that you're on the wrong side of this argument? Well, I have a friend who gives me advice about my interviews that I do, and he doesn't like this analogy of me using it, but I do. I'm going to try it one more time. All right, go for it. You know, I don't know if OJ was guilty or not. His own lawyers alluded or suggested that he was, mm -hmm. if you try to tell his children that daddy killed mommy, you know, he has custody of his children. It was proven in a civil court that he was responsible for their deaths, and yet he got custody of his kids. But if you try to tell his kids that daddy killed mommy, they just won't see it. And that's the American citizenry. There are people I know who have traveled uh, and met with people from the Soviet Union, and they say the only people who think we went to the moon are the Americans. So there's this predisposition for it. You know, during the O.J. Simpson trial, no matter what evidence came forward to prove his guilt, there was always a reason. You know, it's like no matter how much the shadows intersect or how deadly the radiation is, there's always some explanation to say we went to the moon anyway. Yeah. Because people see what they're looking for. And the way I look at it, Tim, is if we really went to the moon, then anyone who says otherwise is an idiot. So, I mean, if you're, if you're people, I naturally, you know, go to moonmovie.com and see it for yourself. I mean, research it for yourself. Absolutely. That's uh, what you tell everybody. But if you typed in moon hoax on Google, the first 15 that come up, and there's money behind this, okay, we know that. 
to beat the first 15 in Google. Mm -hmm. You know, the first 15 are defending that the moon landings are real. Even though you type in moon hoax, the first 15 things that come up say, no, we really went, no, we really went, no, we really went, no, we really went, no, we really went. Yeah. Shakespeare once said, thou dost protest too much. Mm -hmm. If we really went to the moon, anyone who says otherwise is an idiot. So why are there so many websites that took thousands of hours to write and construct and promote defending the allegedly so obvious moon landings, if they're so obvious, to a bunch of idiots, because there is something to defend. You know, when I got punched by Buzz Aldrin, it was because I walked up to him and asked him to swear on the Bible that he walked on the moon. And he had his entourage with him. His, you know, people who travel with him, who think he's a god and, and think he walked on the moon. And, you know, if, if I walked on the moon and anyone who thought Otherwise, I would think that was hysterical. If I walked on the moon and everybody who went to the moon walked on the moon and there were people running around saying it's all done in a TV studio, I would just find that hysterical. Yeah. And if someone asked me to swear on a Bible, I would say, sure, I'll swear on a Bible. You need me to swear on two Bibles? You want me to do it again for you? You feel okay? You need a doctor? But he got angry. It was as if I walked up to him in front of his wife and said, so how's your mistress doing? You see, anger... You know, like that comes from pulling a skeleton out of the guy's closet. I mean, you yourself saw from the clip of the press conference, their one and only press conference, these three guys. I mean, you've seen the locker room after the Super Bowl, the World Series, right? You yeah. cannot wipe the smile, the grins, the glee off anyone's face. Exactly. Yeah. These three guys allegedly, against all odds, did the impossible, and they come back, and for an hour and a half, Every single second of the press conference, it looks like they're at a funeral. There are scowls on their faces. They don't want to answer the questions. And by the way, they're being, they have secret teleprompters hidden on that table, too. They're prompting them. If you really went to the moon, I think you'd probably remember you know, all the details. I don't think you need a little secret teleprompter hidden in the desk to give you the answers to the questions. But that's what they had going on. They knew what they'd done was wrong, and they felt terrible about it, and they were forced to do it anyway, and you can see it in their manner and in their expressions. They look terrible. I mean, we even have a clip at moonmovie.com. Click on the press conference, and you can see their awkwardness and the strangeness that's going on. And, you know, the way I look at it, Tim, is if, if they could go to the moon – that would have a certain level of significance to mankind. Let's say you could yeah. land on another world and plant a flag, and yay, that was the greatest technological achievement since the Titanic. Mm -hmm. Well, that would have a certain level of significance historically to mankind in the history of the human race. Now, if you couldn't go, and you made a boast nationally, and you were so humiliated that you couldn't do it, that you falsified it, that you cheated that you lied, that you embezzled billions of dollars, that you murdered people to make it go down, that you to this day are holding on to the lie, holding on to the lie. You see, Tim, that's more profound of an event than if they had actually gone. I was doing the film under the theory it might be true. All the evidence I've told you so far, I figured they probably went, but there's at least a one out of four chance they didn't. And I thought, that's, that's too big, too big. So I started producing the film, and as you know, we stumbled upon some never-before-seen footage, you know, behind-the-scenes footage of them faking a shot. And when you see it, I mean, there's no explanation. I mean, it's like finding the Bruder film last week. I mean, we found footage of them faking a particular shot of the mission. That means they never left Earth orbit. And it dawns on you that the faking of the moon landing is actually more significant of an event than if they had actually gone. And when people look into it and they study it, they realize this is really true. They really didn't go to the moon. And what we have then is one of the greatest events in human history is the faking of the moon landing out of pride and out of fear of what the other person will think of you. Wow. That's some profound stuff. Um, now, Amongst the uh, moon hoax theory community, there seems to be uh, a few different camps as far as uh, what exactly went down. And I've been able to discern three uh, key ones here. Maybe you can talk about them. And uh, oh, you obviously subscribe to the middle one. Let me run through them. First of all, of course, is the no flight at all, that they never even left uh, the Earth at all and produced the whole thing, you know, in a Hollywood studio and there was no flight. 
Uh, version number two is the one that you subscribe to, which would be a low Earth orbit, and uh, I believe is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then uh, the last one is a full flight to the moon. They landed on the moon, but they faked pictures uh, to cover up something else, aliens, alien artifacts, or, uh, you know, a Russian flag. Who knows? But, you know, you know what I mean. So there's three there's three uh, schools of thought. Maybe I missed one. Maybe you can tell me a different one that I haven't caught here. But those are the no-flight, the low-Earth orbit flight with the whole fakery of the landing, and then a landing with the fakery of the pictures. Can you uh, extrapolate on those a little bit? And why you prefer the one, the center one, the low Earth flight, over the no flight and the full flight with the fake pictures? Yeah, there's the old uh, razor, you know, principle, which says the simplest explanation is likely true. Mm -hmm. The simplest explanation isn't that they went. No, the simplest explanation is that they faked it. Because which is more difficult? to actually fly to the moon in 1969 or, or to do it in a television studio. It's much easier to pretend to go to the moon. I can be pretend to be on the moon right now. It's much easier to pretend to be on the moon than it would be to go to the moon. Yeah. And, and in regard to the third point, you know, the government puts out a lot of interesting misinformation sometimes. Uh, there's like the Kecksburg, Pennsylvania UFO thing. I think uh, the government is so clever, and they, they only get better. You know, if you rob banks successfully and you, and you keep getting away with it, you get better and better. Mm -hmm. And it takes less time to get more money. And as the government got away with the moon landing hoax, they are, number one, emboldened to do more. And that's another good reason for the truth to come out. And then they, they have these multiple layers. They have like the – what really happened, you know, like with Kettsburg, may have been that they shot down a Soviet spy satellite. They didn't want the Soviet Union to know, so they wouldn't change their codes. So they leak out accidentally but deliberately this juicy morsel that it's really a UFO, and they send people down this path. You know, the fact is that a lot of people who believe in UFOs are high intelligent intellectuals. And if they can convince them that we really went to the moon, but the pictures are fake because there's alien bases there or something else, it still gets a whole group of intelligent people to believe we went to the moon when the simple fact is we did not. Bill Casing originally subscribed to the first, and that's why Capricorn One appears this way, that right before the liftoff, you know, they take the guys out and they weren't on the rocket. Well, we know that not to be true for two reasons. Number one, Let's say they they took them off the rocket, then it launches, and then it blows up on the launch pad like the Challenger did. Yeah. Well, then what do you do with the three guys? You know, you have to execute them. I mean, and no one wants to deal with that. It'd be better to just, you know, kill two birds with one stone and put them on the rocket. Plus, they get to go up in front of witnesses. Yeah. And getting real zero-gravity footage is very convincing and extremely difficult to fake. So they put them into Earth orbit so they could get the peanut butter sandwich floating by, and that looks very real. Mm -hmm. Plus, they could also splash down, you know, in front of witnesses. But the the main point that we know the, the second uh, explanation to be true is because of the newly discovered footage. We have a shot of them, and you can see a clip of it at moonmovie.com, of them faking a shot of being halfway to the moon. But the faking of it occurs in Earth orbit. It's one of the few fake shots that the astronauts actually did themselves through a little special effect technique that they did inside of the spacecraft. Yeah. Now, this proves that they were on the rocket. Uh, and, we, you know, I've seen the zero-gravity footage, and that's it's the real deal. I mean, I'm a filmmaker for 20 years. I've been asked to testify in court whether footage is authentic or not or been altered. And this is the real deal. I mean, this I can't fake Neil Armstrong's 35-year younger face in zero gravity. So we know they're in Earth orbit. But the fact is they did not leave Earth orbit. And at the beginning of each shot where they are allegedly halfway to the moon – you know, Neil Armstrong asks NASA something very interesting. He says, well, how far out from the Earth do you have us? Well, he's got the best computer on the planet, you know, right in front of him. So he knows exactly how far away from the Earth he is. He's about 200 miles away from the Earth. But it, the, all the computer guys down at NASA were receiving a, a simulation flight program. The flight director only admitted last year that the ground crew could tell no difference between a simulation and an actual flight, and he didn't want to contradict their data. So when they said, oh, we have you 130,000 miles out, then for the shot he says, all right, this is Neil Armstrong calling in for 130,000 miles out. I mean, why did he need to ask how far out he was when the information is right there in front of him unless he didn't want to contradict the computer program? So this newly discovered footage, which I showed to Bill Casing, 
he agreed that yes, they were on the rocket. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm 100% sure that that was the case. Okay, and you don't subscribe then, obviously, to the uh, the idea that they made it there, but had to cover it up because there's aliens or that, alien ships. You no, know, the, the fact is, if, if 10% of the people at that time thought it was fake in an intelligence video, they would never fake any shot if they really went. Let's say they really went to the moon and they dropped, you know, a canister of film and it broke open and it was ruined. They would never fake the shot, knowing that there was a large group of people, you know, millions of people who doubted it was real. They would never fake it when they really went because it could come back and bite them. Yeah. And the fact is, you know, if you really went, you wouldn't have to fake any of it. It's very simple. You know, we have them faking a shot of being halfway to the moon. And that simply means they could not go halfway. And if the first crew, Apollo 11, cannot go halfway, then none of them can because they had identical equipment. It simply means they none of the missions ever left Earth orbit. None of them ever went to the moon. None of them even orbited the moon. Apollo 10 allegedly orbited the moon, and yet in this footage we uncovered, we have them clearly saying this is the same way Apollo 10 did it, meaning that Apollo 10 didn't leave Earth orbit either. No time has a human ever left Earth orbit unless the Soviets did it and the guy died and they didn't report it because they were too embarrassing too embarrassed because of the loss. All right. Okay. There's also uh, a lot of rumors sort of that have floated around over the years of Stanley Kubrick and his involvement with the moon hoax. Um, what can you say about those theories, about those rumors, and um, is it what kind of evidence is out there to that, those sort of rumors, and do you even pay them much credence? Well, you know, see, now we have an hour. I don't mind going into it. Uh, Go first for it. of all, I just, again, highly encourage people to research it at moonmovie.com. Look at the evidence, decide for themselves. Now, my personal opinion about that, I'd be glad to tell you. Mm -hmm. the, the fact is the moon landings were fake. And I always think, you know, when you have an adversary, well, what would I do if I were them, right? Yeah. If I were them, I would have two choices. Okay, you have to have fake moon photography, right? Mm -hmm. So you have two choices. You either hire the general of the media department at the Pentagon and get great security and amateur results. Or you hire the best filmmaker on the planet, get the short-term benefit of great-looking footage, and worry about security later. Yeah. That had to have been the choice that they made. What a coincidence that Stanley Kubrick, around that time, was making a film about what? Going to the moon. It is an absolute fact that the uh, flight director visited the set of 2001 A Space Odyssey during its filming. Um, also... Uh, Kubrick was, you know, in my opinion, the best filmmaker at the time. He was shooting a film about going to the moon. Uh, there's some other little interesting things. His last film was called Eyes Wide Shut. I always thought, you know, that that title in itself meant something. I mean, you look at me, who from the age of 8 to 14, that's six years, I have the evidence that we didn't go to the moon right in front of me. I mean, I have all these pictures of the shadows intersecting, of the backdrops, you know, being a different color than the foreground, and I never saw it. Yeah. My eyes were wide shut. Well, he stipulated contractually that that particular film be released on a particular date. Mm -hmm. And the studio didn't know why, and it was on a Wednesday, I think, and normally films are released on a Friday, but it's like, you know, who cares? If it makes him happy, we'll put it in the contract. Well, you know, he died before the film was released, and because it was in a contract, it was released on the day that he wanted it to. Look yeah. at this. Eyes Wide Shut debuted on the 30th anniversary of the alleged moon landing, July 20th, 1999. Huh. In the film, The Shining, the little red rum boy, right? Remember him? Yep. He comes up to his mommy or daddy in one of the scenes, and guess what his T-shirt says? What's that? Apollo 11. You know, <laughs> all I can say is, you know, there's – there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that, yes, he did have something to do with it. There's even more. Um, his film after that, uh, after two, 2001 A Space Odyssey, was called Barry Lyndon. Yeah. It was the first film in the history of film production that was all shot with natural or practical lighting, uh, meaning there was no single electric light bulb used in the entire film. Wow. Uh, they used maybe reflectors or something when they're outside, and they used candlelight because it took place, you know, in the 18th century, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, and so they used candlelight. Well, in order to expose the film, 
at that time, which was a mediocre quality film. Uh, they needed a, a particular type of lens, a quote, fast lens. And uh, he got this particular lens that was developed by, guess who? Who's that? NASA. <laughs> and I, I, I suspect that this was part of his negotiation for uh, doing the moon landing, the first one. I, I suspect he only did the first one and then kind of taught, taught them how to do it or they felt like they could take it from there or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he probably did have something to do with it. Um you know, somebody had to shoot it, and he seemed like the prime candidate. And there's all this innuendo in a lot of his projects and a lot of what was going on that suggested that he did. Now, did anybody ever ask him uh, up front uh, if he had any role in the in the creation of the Moon Hopes? Not on the record. Uh, upon his death in 1999, I remember I had AOL at the time and logging on, and the news page said, Stanley Cooper dead at the age of 70. His family says, quote, there were no suspicious circumstances involving his death. I'm like, that's an interesting thing to volunteer. Yeah. Kind of like being pulled over for speeding and saying, I didn't have anything to do with that bank robbery. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's like, why would they say such a thing? It was as if maybe he was retired before he could speak. Yeah. And his family knew it, and they wanted it to stop there and go no further. So they wanted to, you know, show their cooperation. Yeah, you know, nothing nothing suspicious, okay? We're, we're playing ball now, okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of the astronauts dropped dead, you know, until I hit the scene and brought this to a lot of people's attention. A lot of them hit hit, hit the uh, graveyard right at 70 or 69. I mean, it was very consistent. Died at 70, died at 70, died at 69, died at 70. It was as if, you know, they didn't want to kill people right away. They wanted them to retire to a ripe old age and maybe in the 60s. Uh, 70 was considered a ripe old age. Yeah. I mean, right now, uh, people have asked me, am I in danger? Was I ever in danger or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got the hem of the garment. The astronauts, you see, they know everything. Yeah. They know where it was done. They know why it was done. They know how it was done. They know who did it. They know everything. They're the ones who are in danger. And I've let them know this off the record. You know, don't think you're going to die of old age and just kind of drift away into the afterlife. They're keeping an eye on you guys. You know, all the astronauts' deaths have always been sudden. No one has cancer and chemotherapy and time to contemplate the meaning of life. Yeah. In fact, James Irwin from Apollo 15, you know, before I hit the scene, Bill Casey was the leading guy. He was on Oprah begging people to believe we didn't go to the moon. And, um, you know, one day uh, he gets a phone call from one of the astronauts. Now, you've seen astronauts gone wild. Mm -hmm. And so I've been kind of tracking down all the astronauts. You can imagine my surprise. If I pick up the phone one day after it rings, and it's one of the astronauts calling me. Yeah. Well, that happened to him. And um, I think it was um, 1990, I think in 1991 or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, he got a call from James Irwin. And uh, James Irwin said uh, he had become a born-again Christian. And that they needed to have a serious talk about his book, We Never Went to the Moon. Yeah. He said he was concerned for his security and uh, said, why don't you call me at this number three days from now? Three days later, James Irwin had a fatal heart attack. Wow. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah, that's that's you know, so, so Bill's phone was bugged or the astronauts or both or whatever. And, uh, you know, they weren't going to let that guy. And, and they're... You know, three quarters of these people are alive. And, you know, they were in good health back then. That's why they got hired for the job. So most of them have maintained that health pretty well. So they're going to, you know, they're going to be around for at least 10 more years. But but uh, that sand is drifting out of the hourglass. And uh, somebody's got to be afraid of a deathbed confession or memoirs or whatever. I mean, can you imagine those astronauts? I mean, their their wives don't know. For their own protection. Their children don't know. Their priests don't know. They have to carry on this burden that this is how they're introduced. Maybe some love it. Maybe some, it, you know, sours their heart and stomach every time it comes up. Yeah. Now, now uh, let's talk about this a little bit because you had a lot of encounters with these astronauts who uh, who walked on, who, in your opinion, purportedly walked on the moon. Um, what's the general reaction when you talk to them? Um, obviously, we know. Let's let's not get into the Buzz Aldrin thing yet. I want to talk about that in a little more in depth. But aside from the the infamous Aldrin incident, we'll call it. Uh, what 
what's what's been the reaction of the various astronauts you've talked to uh, when presented with the moon hoax? And like you said, when you speak to them off the record and warn them, you know, uh, hey, you better be careful. What's the overall reaction from them? Well, uh, there's a great clip of uh, uh, like a preview or teaser of Astronauts Gone Wild at moonmovie.com. It's like a two-minute clip. You can view it on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And they get angry uh, when, when, when I'm on camera. You know, when I confront them on camera, they just get angry. Yeah. They just turn white. Some of them turn red. They start sweating. They start cursing. They get angry. They become violent. Not only was I hit, I was kicked. I was threatened to be killed by the CIA. Wow. All these things are on tape. I mean, you saw Astronauts Gone Wild, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, these guys uh, get very angry. Now, off the record, um, they're a lot more personable about it and have given me pretty strong indications that, that they didn't go. And, uh, you know, they know that I know. But to them, I'm like a mosquito in the Taj Mahal, you know. Yeah. yeah. But, but uh, you know, my film inspired the Fox special, Conspiracy Theory, Did We Land on the Moon? We, we showed a funny thing happened on the way to the moon to Fox. They loved it. They also said we can't air it. Our legal department will not let us air it. Can you imagine a film too controversial for Fox? <laughs> and they said, you know, you're too one-sided. We want to present both sides. And I'm like, we've heard their side for 35 years. Yeah. You know, give us 35 years, then they deserve equal time. And the fact is we have this footage that proves they never left Earth orbit. So we already know they didn't go. Uh, but they said they want to interview me and do this. Well, the show was so successful. It aired a second time. So successful it aired a third time. Well, at, at the time we released The Funny Thing Happened, uh, or right before it, the, the national average on whether the moon landings were real in people's mind was still only 10% of the people doubted it. But since my film came out in the Fox special, that has gone to 15%. And now that I've made this film and confronted the astronauts, now other filmmakers are doing it too. And, you know, you got a, a little bit feel for these guys. I mean, they were hoping, I'm sure, to go to the grave and for the truth to come out afterwards. Yeah. And now, you know, that dike has got some cracks in it and there's some water leaking while they're still alive. That's got to be a very unpleasant feeling for them. Another thing, it's not like there was just one guy who went to the moon once on one mission. That would be a lot better if the guy was alive, you know. But there's, you know, 15, 20 of them still around. And if any individual confesses, he's really confessing for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, if one guy's moon mission was fake, you know, the likelihood is that they were all fake. Yeah. And so they've got to have a pact, you know, that, that we just won't do it. Um, you know, too bad there's not another guy like Irwin or too bad – I didn't, you know, get started on this sooner, and I would have had a chance to talk to him, but now, who knows what will happen. Now, you say that uh, off the record they give you sort of a uh, – they sort of suggest that you might be on the right direction or something. Can you can you elaborate on that a little more um, as no, much as you I, feel I can, like you can say? I don't want to go into that, but what I can say is what we do have on camera, and particularly in the Buzz Aldrin interview, the first interview – where he believes we're interviewing him about some book he allegedly wrote. And um, we're there to say, well, no, we want to talk about the moon landings. And they're like, well, that's old news. And I said, well, it's not because we found this footage. And I show him the newly discovered footage of him faking a shot. He was the one operating the camera during this fake shot. Mm -hmm. And he says on camera, and this makes you some famous person, what an ego you must have to want to propel your career like this. Well, how can I be famous if I'm wrong? How can my career be propelled if I'm wrong? You know, he, he virtually admitted it right there. And then when he realized that, he said, you can't show my this tape to anybody or I'll sue you. You know, he realized he said some things during that interview that were, you know, pretty much saying he didn't go to the moon, in, in other words. And he said, like, you know, you can't – I don't give you – give you permission to show this interview. I'm like, you know, too late. We didn't hold a gun to your head. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this, um, is, this is news, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about the infamous, uh, when I was, since we're on the subject of Buzz Aldrin, let's talk about the infamous Buzz Aldrin uh, incident, if you will. Uh, a lot of people have seen it. It's one of the most famous uh, pieces of footage as far as esoteric film go out there. Uh, set the stage for us. Tell us uh, your perspective on what went down that fateful day when you and Buzz Aldrin ran into each other. Well, uh, there was a Japanese production company who contacted me uh, and wanted and 
brought me over to Japan a couple of times to uh, do a book about me and the uh, idea that the moon landings were fake, uh, to appear on a couple of talk shows, which I did, and TV shows there. Uh, and they wanted to pursue it a little bit. So they uh, got Buzz Aldrin to do an interview in Beverly Hills at uh, some famous hotel, the Wilshire or something or other. I don't know what it is. Anyway, up in the penthouse, they rented it out, and they had a camera crew. And then I brought my camera crew, and I was to be the surprise guest who came in at the very end to confront him uh -oh. whether or not uh, he went to the moon or not. Mm -hmm. After my initial interview with him where he you know, largely suggested I was right that we didn't go, it was after that that I came up with the idea, well, why don't I just ask these guys to swear on the Bible? And that was kind of how Astronauts Gone Wild got created. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, that he, uh, I don't, I won't, don't want to – people to get this wrong, saying we didn't go to the moon, you know, in my mind, is not unpatriotic. It is patriotic. You know, when the government does something fraudulent to this degree, you know, I know everyone wants to believe we went to the moon, and I know it would be a much better world and country if we did. You know, my eyes are open to the fact that we didn't. And, you know, I, I think America has a lot of wonderful qualities, and the government does a lot of good things that other governments don't even come close to doing. So I want to say that, that, you know, to me and the people involved in this project, we're patriots. We just want the government to be better mm -hmm. and, to, you know, to improve and to take responsibility for their actions. Also, uh, I want to do the same thing about this encounter with Buzz. You know, it took me almost two years afterwards to realize, you know, that, you know, I think the punch was my fault. Um, what happened, you know, while these things are planned to a certain degree, I mean, the interview is planned and it's planned for me to, you know, to can challenge on whether he went to the moon or not. Yeah. Any words that come out of my mouth or his mouth, you know, they're just improv made up on the spot. And, you know, the heat got kind of turned up and he got angry and we have two camera crews running around chasing after him. And I'm putting the Bible in his face and saying, why don't you swear in the Bible? And he won't do it. You know, he will not swear in the Bible that he walked on the moon. And it just kind of irritated me that this guy just got paid $2,000 an hour as all of these astronauts. We paid each astronaut like $2,000 for an hour interview to, to talk about something they didn't do. And I said, that makes you a thief. You yeah. just stole $2,000, right? And you're a liar. And you're a coward for not wanting to come forward and tell the truth. Well, so I called him a liar, a coward, and a thief. Now, I didn't wake up that morning and say, gosh, I can't wait to call Buzz Aldrin a liar, a coward, and a thief. But <laughs> the heat just got turned up, you know, and he yeah. was getting riled up, and I was getting riled up, and I said it. And it, it upset him, and he punched me. You know, I didn't take any particular offense to the punch, to be quite honest. I mean, he had a good punch. He's still in great shape. He's quick. You know, I didn't see it coming and knocked me back a couple of feet. You know, his, his explanation as to what was happening, you know, to the media was completely wrong and lying. I mean, he, he didn't have – I didn't have him up against the corner. He had me up against the corner, you know. Yeah. And trying to defend you know, why he did. I mean, sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. At the same time, you know, I, I'm not without sin or without fault in my own life. So – Am I a liar and a coward and a thief too sometimes? Well, yeah. Which means, you know, what did Jesus say? The ye without sin cast the first stone. And I was casting a stone at him. And I was also doing it, you know, in a public place, in front of people and in front of news cameras. And I don't think that was respectful. Even though the guy didn't go to the moon, and even though I, you know, wish that the guy would come forward and come clean, that still doesn't mean I have the right to be disrespectful to him. And I think I was disrespectful to him. You know, sad to say it took me two years to realize that. But at the same time, you know, you know, it's the truth. I think it was my fault that that event happened. I think it was wrong for me to call him a liar, a coward, and a thief. And had I not done that, he wouldn't have punched me. Yeah. So just want to go on the record and say that. And I've written him a letter of apology. And I don't think any less of him. I probably think more of him. You know, brothers – you know, wrestle around <laughs> each other, you know? Yeah. We're, we're in the struggle together. He's got his own struggle in his own heart. I mean, if he were the only man who walked on the moon, I bet he would come forward and tell the truth. But he's not. There's all these other people who are alive, whose lives he would ruin also. You know, maybe they don't want their lives ruined. I mean, one of these guys became a United States senator. Other people are CEOs, you know, getting paid huge salaries, not for any ability, but because they're the flagship CEO, a guy who walked on the moon, you know? Yeah. And 
you know, it'd be ruining all and maybe ruining the country. I mean, maybe there's that pressure too. Then he'd then he'd be saying, "Oh my God, the country is this corrupt," and you know, it, it's kind of weird. I mean, I've met news directors at NBC who I show this footage to, and they say, "You know what? We didn't go to the moon, but I won't air it because I'm afraid this will cause a civil war." And I'm like, you know, you got to let the chips fall where they may. I don't think it's going to cause a civil war. We have too much structure in place for that to happen. Yeah. But it, what it would cause is reform in the government. But I've had people in the news say, you're right, we didn't go. And, and I, won't, I, I can't hear it with a clear conscience because it would cause such turmoil. Now, I, I want to ask you to uh, clear up one thing about the, uh, the Buzz Aldrin footage, and that's just sort of a minor detail. But who's that woman that sort of gets in the way in the middle of the shot there? It's sort of that is his yellow... daughter. That is his wife's daughter. Oh, okay. And she was there trying to block the camera from being on and standing in front of the camera. And the, my cameraman, I didn't know what he was doing. I was like, put it on your shoulder. Don't be shy. He's like, he wanted to pretend like he wasn't shooting. So he kind of had it down by his waist, holding it, pointing it up. And she was, you know, trying to block the shot. If you kind of see, you know, the, the, the punch just, you know, perfect timing and ends up being on camera because the camera's blocked right beforehand and the camera's blocked right afterwards. But there's that punch, right? Perfectly crisscrossed between the two people blocking the camera. And, you know, I felt like sending, you know, Buzz a box of cigars saying, thank you so much for punching me. I, they've shown it on Leno and Letterman and Good Morning America. We've got such great free publicity. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. But I fear for him because People got to, you know, who are, who know that we didn't go to the moon or keeping an eye on him wonder, you know, if this guy can't control himself. If he can't control his arm, maybe he can't control his lips. Yeah. You know? Um, now, uh, just to, just to sort of tie a bow here on this, on the Buzz Aldrin story, talk about the media sensation that happened. Like you just said, it was on the Tonight Show and uh, the Today Show and all these other shows. Uh, talk about that media sensation that happened after the footage came out because, all of a sudden, you were like all over the place, and, and everybody was talking about this footage. And what was that like to be in the spotlight there for uh, that amazing situation? Well, I have a background doing theater, so I've been on stage probably a thousand times since I was 14 years old. So being in front of a camera or whatever, I, I can whether I'm not nervous half the time, and the other half I'm nervous and faking like I'm not. You know what I mean? Yeah. What What was exciting to me about it was that it. it propelled our cause forward. See, this is a cause. Again, you know, you can look at it as, as a political cause and that our government, you know, did fake the moon landings. And George Orwell says, whoever controls the past controls the future. And it's like as someone addicted to gambling, you know, if they keep getting away with it or keep robbing banks or keep doing whatever, they're going to do the same or worse. And that's why the truth needs to come out. But I think overall, it, it tells something about humanity, that humanity is in such despair that when we set a goal to go to the moon and we couldn't do it, we were so juvenile that we pretended to go and we murdered people and embezzled billions of dollars. And to this day, somebody's putting a lot of money into these websites to defend these so obvious moon landings. I mean, it's like going down to their grave holding on to the lie, you know? It just tell you know when when I realized when it dawned on me when I saw the secret footage that we of them faking being halfway to the moon I mean it just broke my heart I was like oh my god this is really true this is mankind you know we know about all the crimes and weird you know things going on in the world and to add on top of that that mankind was just so fearful or juvenile or whatever that we would fake the moon landings it's just sad yeah yeah. Um, now, do you expect there to be ever a whistleblower situation where one of the astronauts will speak out? Maybe the last one alive will will uh, will be the one that's that you know that has to bear the responsibility of being the one to say something. Well, we live in an exciting time because uh, that hour is started now, you know, yeah. and it'll it'll conclude in only about ten years. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say you know it dep there's probably a ten percent chance that that's going to happen. Uh, of course, when I started the film, I was just doing it under the theory it might be true. And yeah. I thought, we'll never know, not in my lifetime, whether we went to the moon or not. I was wrong, uh, thankfully. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm thinking right now there's about a 10% chance that one of the astronauts will come forward to clear his conscience. You know, that's better than a no percent chance. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I think eventually, uh, maybe, you know, 50 years, 100 years, the government's going to change or no one's going to care. But 
but it's still dangerous because what they've done is they've they've misled people. They've misled uh, intelligent people, and if if let's just say NASA is is sincere about wanting to quote return to the moon, if they think it was so easy to play golf on the moon, you know, in the '60s and early '70s, then they're they're going to kill themselves trying to reach the moon now. Yeah. I mean, people are going to die if they try to go to the moon. You know, a good friend of mine once said, you can be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. And they didn't want NASA to know. They, You know, very few people at NASA knew, just a handful of people knew aside from the astronauts. And then the people in the, you know, in the government installation who were already sworn to secrecy for who knows what else. Yeah. You know, so the moon landings could have been done with as little as 200 or less people knowing. No, not, not oh. the hundreds of thousands. Very few. And of that uh, small group of people, have there been any prominent whistleblowers to uh, to the moon hoax? Bill Casing, you know, he worked, you know, on the space program for six and a half years. Uh, he he was the most prominent one. Uh, there are other filmmakers who have come forward and said, "Yeah, I mean, these pictures were not taken in sunlight, which means they're not on the moon." Uh, other intellectuals have come forward and said, "Yeah, the moon landings are fake," uh, but. A lot. It would be like a religious person coming forward and saying, "Well, you know, uh, Jesus did sin, and uh, you know, he, he had three wives and whatever." You know what I mean? I don't think that's true. Yeah. But it would be kind of like that if you're if you're a professor at a university and you come forward and say the moon landings are fake. You know, you might as well start looking for a job. Yeah. Okay. Now, and sort of pulling back a little bit and looking at the big picture here. Uh, you, you say like this moon hoax, it's sort of like a movement. Um, I've noticed throughout my time studying uh, all the various esoteric fields uh, that the moon hoax is sort of like the bastard child of esoterica, where, you know, it, it really gets no respect. It's sort of downplayed and, and crapped on, really, by a lot of people in the esoteric movement in general. Uh, first of all, why do you think this is, and how does that make you feel as one of the big, big names in the moon hoax movement to uh, to be a part of a field that's really put upon so much? Well, you know, uh, I, there was a, a line from George Burns in the movie God mm -hmm. when, you know, no one believed him that he actually spoke with God, and he said, you know, per, uh, Copernicus and all this was under house arrest for saying that the Earth was the third planet out instead of the sun being the third body out with the Earth at the center. And he said, you're in good company. You know, to me, it seems odd to believe in UFOs. Not that there isn't possibly life out there, but yeah. we're so far apart from one another. And that I just find the likelihood of being able to travel those distances being really, really hard to believe. You know, show me one little green man and I'll believe. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I personally don't believe in UFOs. You know, I think there statistically probably is life out there. Maybe, maybe there have been visits, but I don't know. I haven't seen any, you know, show me one. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is we didn't go to the moon. It's very simple. It's an illusion. You know, Copperfield does not levitate elephants. You know, it's impossible yeah. to levitate an elephant. And people have to realize that the space shuttle can only go 200 miles above the Earth with today's 21st century technology, how could we possibly have gone a quarter of a million miles away almost four decades ago, you know, <laughs> with, even before digital watches? Yeah. It just doesn't add up. People want to believe it, just like a child wants to believe in Santa Claus. And it's a big – I remember when I was told there was no Santa Claus, I went up to bed and I wept myself to sleep. <laughs> and I think people have that in their hearts. You know, they, they maybe even doubt that the moon landings are, are real, but they don't want to believe it because it will crush them to realize this is the type of government that we're under. Yeah, yeah. And what about have you gotten any much support from people in the UFO field or, uh, you know, various other fields in the esoteric psychic type field or anything like that where, you know, they, they, they come out and come to bat for the moon hoax theory? Well, I don't know much about the UFO community. I know a little bit about it because I have a couple of friends in it. Uh, from what I understand, the vast majority of them believe that the moon landings are real and that the reason why the pictures are fake is because there's alien – you know, bases there or some secret crew was sent to the moon and this was the fake crew. It's all a government snow job simply because we didn't go to the moon. And anything that helps people believe that we did go to the moon, whether it's aliens or whatever, the government likes that. They want people to believe we went to the moon because the simple fact is we did not, we do not have the capability. 
If we if we can't go to the moon today, which we obviously cannot, mm-hmm. how can we go 40 years ago? It just, I mean, it, you just got to want to know and want to love the truth more than you want to be right. Yeah. Um, and now you talked a little bit about the Fox special. Uh, what do you think about the mainstream media coverage of the moon hoax uh, theory in general? Are you happy with how it's all played out? Do you think it could be a little fairer? Like you said that you thought that, you know, that they had 35 years to get their story out and you should get have a chance to put yours out unencumbered. Um, is that mostly your bone of contention with the mainstream media? Well, uh, yeah, I think the way they've handled it is extremely unfair. Uh, the best, you know, broadcast program on the subject was the Fox special, you know, which was inspired by my film and they used parts of it and interviewed me in a site. You know, that was a fair shake. Uh, that, that was a fair representation of the argument. Aside from that, no one wants to touch it. It sounds nutty. It sounds too hard to believe, too conspiratorial, too whatever. Uh, you know, the, the way, I mean, the New York Times has done a story on it and of course all these, you know, stations that I mentioned, they've done it. But the reason why they do it, it's more like, isn't it interesting that there's a group of people who believe we didn't go to the moon, that it was done in a TV studio? Isn't that interesting? When you ask them to really look at it seriously, they won't do it. Uh, I remember, you know, when the New York Times article came out and they did a four-page story on me in the film, and I thought they did a pretty fair job representing both sides of the story. Uh, the Washington Post called me up and said, hey, you know, we saw the New York Times. Hey, we want to do a story on you, too. Nice. So I so I sent a guy, you know, the the uh, writer out there, copy of the film, and uh, said, "Well, well, what do you think?" Well, he says, "Well, that's not important." I said, "Well, it is important. Don't you realize that your paper dethroned, you know, a corrupt president? I mean, that was because of you guys. Yeah, it's because of your paper that Nixon got booted out of office." And I said, "Well, what about that window shot footage? The footage of them faking being halfway to the moon. What did you think of that?" You know what he said? What? I can't explain it. Huh. And I said, you're right. Don't you see? That's the story. That you have footage from the moon landing that you cannot explain why it looks the way that it does. You know, in the Fox special, there are two things that stood out to me if I tried to be objective, you know, looking at it. One was when the maker of the still camera that was taken to the moon, when when the guy had the sun behind him and yet the front of him was lit up, like like he had a you know a light on him. Yeah. He he said, well, why does it look that way? He looked down at his hands and said, well, I can't explain it. And then me, you know, when I say I would bet my life that we did not go to the moon. I've done eight years of research, going on ten, and I bet my life on it. There's no question that we went to the moon or not. You got to understand, I went from being the biggest fan to thinking possibly we didn't go to realizing, you know, we just didn't go. That's just that's just a sad truth. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the big arguments uh, for people who are proponents, actually, this kind of goes both ways uh, on both sides of the argument. Everyone sort of says, well, why don't they uh, take a picture of the stuff that was left behind by the Apollo missions that are purportedly still on the moon, you know, uh, the flag and all the various junk and stuff that was left there. Have there been attempts to take pictures of that stuff? And, well, first start with that. Have there been attempts to take pictures of that stuff? Well, there's a lot of people who think you can point a telescope at the moon and see artifacts or footprints or the flag. That's folklore. It's not true. According Mm -hmm. to NASA, there's no Earth-based telescope powerful enough to see any man-made objects if there are any on the moon. Uh, Also, according to NASA, the Hubble telescope is too powerful to resolve focusing to the moon. Through second-hand information, I found someone who did work on the Hubble and said it could definitely take pictures of the moon and see whether stuff was there or not, but they've just never bothered doing it because they know it's really there. So it's kind of a catch-22. Yeah. It's like the uh, the leading expert of the radiation belt uh, that surrounds the Earth was my age, four years old, when they went to the moon. And he says, well, I know the radiation is not dangerous because they went through it six times to the moon and back. They're, that's how I know it's not dangerous. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, we're kind of stuck in this catch-22. Yeah. The other proof they say is the moon rocks. Well, you know, they had this goal that they were desperate to make to reach the moon before the end of the 1960s, and yet Von Braun, you know, the leader of the whole thing, had time to vacation down in Antarctica to retrieve lunar meteorites, and that's where the moon rocks came from, and their only other third point or proof that they say they went to the moon 
is uh, the laser reflectors that are allegedly on the moon. And you can bounce, you know, a laser. Well, you can bounce a laser off the moon with a reflector or not. And the fact is the Soviet Union put laser reflectors on the moon two years before Apollo 11 with an unmanned probe. However, Japan, several years ago, did send a probe to the moon that did have the capability uh, of taking close enough pictures of the moon's surface to see whether or not there were any artifacts there. They had five different type of cameras, you know, video, film, infrared, whatever. Yeah. As soon as it achieved lunar orbit, mysteriously all five cameras simultaneously malfunctioned. Oh, and, weird. you know, the Japanese can't make a good camera. <laughs> then the space agency, I, I spoke with the director of the European Space Agency for 45 minutes, and he was actually open-minded to the idea that we didn't go to the moon. And I said, well, this latest probe that you guys sent to the moon, can it, can it take the pictures? He said, no, it's, it doesn't have that sharp of resolution. <laughs> I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Either it does, and they're lying because they're, the U.S. government is twisting their arm, yeah. you know, that – that uh, or they're just you know sending inferior equipment to to the moon. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Now, do you think uh, do you think that technology will advance to the point uh, here on Earth that at some point we'll be able to look at the moon and settle this once and for all? And uh, as a subset to that question, if there was if that day came and there was a picture of the stuff left behind on the moon, would you change your opinion on the entire scenario? Well, the reason why people think we went to the moon is because of false pictures, mm -hmm. false TV pictures and false still pictures. That's that's why people think we went to the moon when we didn't go. The thing is they can they can make more false pictures, you know. So, no, that wouldn't be proof that we went to the moon if they suddenly had a telescope that was more powerful and you saw something there on the moon. They could have just faked that picture, like all the other pictures that they faked. All right. Just kind of, you got to ask the questions, you know what I mean? Yeah. To get back to the first part of that question, do you think there will be an advancement enough in, in uh, human technology here on Earth that we'll be able to settle the question uh, once and for all? And that, sort of by the way you answered the second part, suggests that there really would be only one potential answer here that we'd be able to find. Well, you know, if the world doesn't end in the near future... <laughs> Uh, technology eventually will progress enough to where some country like Iran or Iraq or Cuba or somebody uh, is going to be able to see that there's nothing there on the moon and they'll make they'll make a fuss over it. Uh, but that might be 50, 100 years from now. So who knows? I mean, the great convenient thing uh, for the government is like, well, prove we didn't go. I mean, how can, how can we prove they went? How can we prove they didn't go? Who can go to the moon except the government, you know, and it's yeah. a quarter million miles away. There's no independent verification. And we have one of the greatest events in human history and no independent press coverage whatsoever. Whatever we got was a TV picture controlled by the government. And if it went black at their discretion or, you know, turned on or off or whatever, it was completely controlled by the government. Yeah. I mean, no one ever thought, you know, you're letting the kid be in charge of the candy store here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, you've been in the moon hoax research field for a long time. Where does the field need to go from here to uh, further advance the cause? Is this the sort of situation where uh, it's such an isolated incident that it happened so long ago that we're sort of running out of time, there's not too many various areas we can look into, kind of like the JFK assassination and Roswell situation where, you know, we're a race with the undertaker here to get any information out of firsthand witnesses? Is there more that people can do who are in the field to find out and try and get more answers about the moon hoax? Well, the hope that we have is that one of the astronauts will want to come forward and set the record straight, uh, or that some uh, uh, other country is going to have the technology and the uh, willpower to prove that we didn't go. Uh, the, the U.S. government is so powerful, uh, you know, we can talk Iran into, you know, disassembling their nuclear power plants if we want, just by bribing them, giving them several billion dollars, print it off and send it to them. Um, I mean, Japan, you would think, but then we've probably got Japan over a barrel in some way that, you know, that we don't know about. It's gonna, gonna be tough. I would say one of the astronauts coming forward is our best shot or waiting another 50, 100 years for it to be so far in the past that the government doesn't care anymore. I don't know. Do you think if they advanced technologically enough to actually land on the moon and do it for real, do you think that they would backtrack that and, and admit that it was all phony? Or do you think that they would just sort of press on with the story? Well, I don't think they'll be able to go to the moon in, in 2020. I think it's extremely, extremely difficult to go to the moon. Uh, 
the, the, the idea that they could um, do something like that the first time and not kill anybody is really preposterous. Um, if they truly, they're either going to do one of two things. They're either going to sincerely try to go to the moon, you know, around 2020 or a little bit after. And if they do that, you know, they're going to kill a lot of people trying. I mean, they're going to kill the first crew, the second crew, the third crew, the fourth crew until they figure that out. Even Von Braun himself said, even if you could go to the moon and land on the moon, you'd have to immediately go into a cave. Because there would be a 50% chance of a catastrophic failure every 24 hours from a micrometeorite. I mean, the moon has no atmosphere whatsoever. And all those, you know, chicken pot marks on the moon are, you know, meteorites. The tiniest little grain of sand traveling at 40,000 miles an hour will go through you, through your spacesuit, and de, you know, uh, pressurize the entire spacecraft. Yeah. I don't even know that you could go to the moon, <laughs> you, yeah. you know, and yeah. walk around with no atmosphere, with micrometeorites. I don't even know that that's possible. Now, let's talk about your uh, four films here. Uh, run through them and, and, you know, tell us about the films. I, I watched A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon last night. I saw Astronauts Gone Wild over the weekend. Also, you have Apollo 11 Monkey Business and Apollo 11 Post-Flight Press Conference. I can't put over the Post-Flight Press Conference enough. That is a fantastic piece of footage. Um, even if you're someone who's listening to this and you're like, that moon hoax is a bunch of bunk and I don't believe any of it, blah, 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 uh, definitely check out the Apollo 11 post-flight press conference, irregardless of how you stand on it, because the footage is awesome and it's historical in nature and it really, uh, it's, it's a wealth of information just on that. But also, let's talk about the four films. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. That's, of course, your baby, correct? Yeah. These, again, are at moonmovie.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, these four films cost nearly a million dollars to produce. Wow. And you can get all four of them in a box set for $15 each or $60 for all four. Nice. The funny thing happened on the way to the moon was the one that took five years, the one that contains the newly discovered footage of the fake photography, of them faking a shot of being halfway to the moon and showing how they did it. You can see the outtakes so that it's definitely a fake shot. Uh, that explains, you know, the history of the Cold War, the goal by Kennedy, and um, – it's, you know, my favorite and best film. Uh, uh, Astronauts Gone Wild is a, a confrontation of me with nine Apollo astronauts. Uh, most of them don't give interviews, so we track them down at public places and simply ask them to swear on the Bible. You can see me ask Neil Armstrong to swear on the Bible. I offer him $5,000 cash to go to charity, uh, to go to Hawaii, uh, whatever. He won't take a thousand dollars a second to put his hand on the Bible and swear to God he walked on them and he won't do it. He starts shaking like a leaf. They're afraid that this could come back as a video deposition and they'd be guilty of perjury. The third film, post-flight press conference, is uh, their one and only press conference that the three of them gave together. And we've uh, color corrected it, transferred it from 16 millimeter film, synchronized the two cameras together. And you just see their expressions for an hour and a half as they allegedly talk about what it was like to walk on the moon. And they just, you know, look like they're at a funeral for an hour and a half. And then Monkey Business is the um, uh, newly discovered footage in its entirety. We show about five minutes to ten minutes of it, and a funny thing happened. Yeah. Uh, and this is it in its entirety. So you can see, you know, them doing this fake shot 30 times over and over again. We also have uh, footage in it allegedly out the window of the command module as it orbits the Earth. I'm mean, sorry, as it orbits the moon at 4,000 miles an hour. So you see out the window the moon going by, the moon going by, and then it stops and kind of adjusts horizontally and vertically just a little bit more and then picks back up at 4,000 miles an hour again, which, of course, it'd be impossible to stop on a dime going 4,000 miles an hour and then to suddenly accelerate back to 4,000 miles an yeah. hour. They were using a model, and we got an outtake of it showing this particular imperfection, revealing that, in fact, it's a model of lunar orbit. Then we have a shot of them walking on the moon with the original slate in front of it. The slate has the date on it. Uh, we ha- It's dated five days before they left. So we have a shot of them walking on the moon dated five days before they left by NASA. It's like, well, could they have gotten the date wrong? Gee, I think NASA knows what day of the week it is and what time of day it is. They kind of you know, put it on everything. Yeah. I don't think they'd make a mistake like that. And all that is in monkey business. And then most recently, uh, we bought at a state auction from one of the widows of the Apollo 1 fire the congressional report uh, of the Apollo 1 fire, which is the crew that would have been the first crew to walk on the moon. 
and how they died in this alleged accident on the launch pad right after, you know, their commander became very critical of NASA, enough to hang a lemon on the door of the command module indicating that the equipment was a lemon. And he held an impromptu press conference, which got him in hot water. And, you know, shortly thereafter, he was burned alive. And we have the congressional report that's on data DVD that indicates that they were poisoned by cyanide gas prior to the fire, and that the fire was set to get rid of the evidence of the homicide. And all that's at moonmovie.com. It's taken, you know, 10 years almost to put all this stuff together. It cost us a million dollars. We're nowhere near to breaking even yet. Uh, and you can get um, all four films for $59. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we've gone over the whole moon, fo- moon hoax theory here. Uh, is there anything else you want to throw into the pile? Any more evidence you want to throw in there that people should consider and think about? Uh, yeah, it actually came uh, up in the news recently, about four weeks ago. It was brought to my attention, and I didn't even know this with all the years of research I've done, uh, that the the way that most of the public was convinced that the moon landings were real was because of the television images, which, of course, were black and white and kind of grainy. Yeah. often wondered. You know, they're they're trying to boast this great technological achievement of being on the moon, and yet they can't even have a color video camera because a color video camera back then was high resolution. I mean, if Gillian's Island is good enough to be promoted from black and white to color in 1967, I would think, gee, maybe the moon landing in color, that would be nice. Yeah. But they didn't do it in color because it revealed too much detail. The signal allegedly came from the moon. In fact, it was bounced off the moon from Earth. It was picked up at a tracking station in uh, uh, Australia, mm-hmm. and that was transmitted to NASA. So already we're at like third generation. And then in NASA, that image was projected like a projection TV. And you remember how good projection TVs were like 10 years ago? Yeah. Imagine how good they were 40 years ago. Oh, boy. And then that was then filmed with a television camera, and that signal was sent out to the world. The networks complained because because they weren't even allowed to be given a live feed from Australia. They were forced to project, shoot it off of a projection screen. It was as if they were deliberately trying to degrade the signal to fuzz up the pictures. Well, the fact is they had never faked going to the moon before. So why reveal too much detail of a fake scene, you know? Mm-hmm. So they deliberately made a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of the image. Well, and came out four weeks ago that there are these slow scan television images, which are two inch data tape, which are virtually digital videotape from 1969. And these images are four times the resolution that has ever before been seen of any TV image of any moon landing. And they have never before been seen by the human eye. Well, these are stored in the National Archives with the Declaration of Independence and probably George Washington's wooden teeth and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, a filmmaker found out that they um, uh, were disassembling deliberately the only machine that could ever possibly read these television images that are, again, four times the quality that that have ever before been seen from any television picture from any moon mission. And get this, every single tape from every single moon mission vanished from the National Archives four weeks ago. Wow. Gee, you know. Where was that Declaration of Independence? Did you have it? I thought, did you have it? Where did I put that? <laughs> no. You, and I, I've calculated that this material, you know, probably physically weighed about a ton. Oh, wow. So they misplaced a ton of material. Literally. And they hermetically sealed. I'm sure that's pretty good security at the National Archives. And suddenly, one ton of material, every single videotape from every single moon mission has now disappeared. The 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 one that's four times the quality, you see, they would probably reveal fake backdrops. And they had to make, you know, less or two evil choices. They could either release those to the world and people would see, you know, that's a fake backdrop. Or they could just have them disappear, which doesn't really help their cause either. You know what I mean? Exactly. I mean, after my film came out in the Fox special, it went up to 15% of the American public doubted the authenticity of the moon landings. But there had to be another 15% who were kind of on the fence. And when something like this happens, I mean, it made national news. Yeah. they The government lost these tapes. Now, if the government is so incompetent that they can't keep a ton of material in the National Archives without misplacing them, then how could they possibly be competent enough to send men to the moon back in 1969? Or they deliberately disappeared. And the only reason why they would deliberately disappear would be if we didn't go to the moon and they revealed too much detail. 
So either way, it proves we didn't go to the moon. There you go. There you go. Uh, what's next on the plate for Bart Sebrell? What do you have uh, in the pipeline? What's in the works? Well, um, we're thinking about interviewing some cosmonauts and former KGB people. Huh. Um, there are apparently uh, one or more cosmonauts who have finally come on the record and said, you know, the Americans did not go to the moon. They may be boat rockers and they may have been told by their government to keep their mouth shut because of an agreement, you know, the higher ups have with each other. But they're, they're finally want to speak their mind and say, hey, you know, we just didn't go. I mean, if, if they couldn't go, if they launched the first satellite, animal, man, woman, if they did first, 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 spent 500 hours in space for every 100 hours we spent, and never even sent a man to orbit the moon, you know, it just really starts to not make sense. Yeah. Did uh, that kind of remind that kind of brings up a small question here? Actually, let's uh, throw this one in. Also, uh, did the Russians, after the Americans landed on the moon, why did the Russians just abandon going altogether? Did, did, was it like once we did, then they didn't want to do it anymore? Type of situation? Or? Well, I think the whole point was to be first. Yeah. Uh, that was it to be first. And if they couldn't be first, then why bother trying? Um, at the same time. Uh, it certainly would have historic um, benefit, nevertheless. It would also have a lot of scientific benefit. So I would think, you know, they would try to up us one way, like maybe stay there longer, build a moon base there or something like that. That's a great question because why didn't they? I mean, they they never did. They never sent a man even into lunar orbit. Why? Why has Japan never done it? I mean, Japan has had video cell phones around for seven years, and we still don't have video, two-way video cell phones here in America. And Japan has had them for seven years. Wow. Japan is really advanced technologically. And, you know, they can send a probe to the moon that could take pictures, but, of course, the camera malfunctions. So maybe we're at a nice critical period here in history, Tim, where – or something is going to hit the fan. You know, I just pray that the truth does come out. I think it would be for the benefit of mankind, certainly the benefit of our country. It's kind of like having gangrene on your leg and pretending like you don't have it. Yeah. You know, admitting, the government admitting and it coming out that we didn't go to the moon, you know, that's that's heartache. At the same time, you know, that's like losing a leg. But it's better to lose the leg and save the body than for the body to go. And if our government keeps going down this road of faking the moon landings and other stuff like that, you know, the citizens are in for a world of trouble. Absolutely. That's the truth. All right. We talked about the movies here. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. Astronauts gone wild. Apollo 11 monkey business and Apollo 11 post-flight press conference. You can find those at moonmovie.com. It's a very compelling story. It's very interesting. Uh, like I said, going into this, you know, I wasn't a big moon hoax believer, but, you know, there's always that crack of doubt in my mind, and it's always great to hear from somebody who, who's on top of the field and who can throw a lot of great informa information at me that I hadn't even heard before. So uh, hats off to you for that. Hopefully you've reached some people here tonight that uh, that will look into the thing. Check out the movies at moonmovie.com. You know, Bart said it himself. Check it out. Do your own research. You know, don't just listen to Bart and say, you know, all right, it's a moon hoax. You know, do your own research. Check it out. Bart, thanks for being on the show. All righty. Well, thanks, Tim. That does it for this week's edition of Been All of America Audio. Big thanks to Bart Sabrell for coming on the show and sharing his insights with us on the moon hoax theory. For more information on Bart Sabrell and his films, check out www.moonmovie.com. Moving right along now, it's time for the portion of the show we like to call Been All of America Audio Listener Feedback. And this week's letter was featured in the Banal Report a few weeks back, but I wanted to flesh it out a little bit because it was addressed to Banal of America Audio, and it seemed like one of the perfect letters for listener feedback. So let's dig right into this one. It comes from Lauren in Rhode Island, and here's what Lauren had to say. Hi there. I'm a college student in Rhode Island who has a secret fascination with all things esoteric. I really enjoy the program you put on, and I find them very informative, but down to earth as well. I think there is a good combination of skepticism and belief that is hard to find on the internet. Anyway, just thought I'd let you know how awesome your show is and to keep up the great work. Signed, Lauren in Rhode Island. Well, thank you very much for writing, Lauren. I appreciate the feedback. One of the reasons why I wanted to feature this on the segment here is because it's really awesome to have listeners from that younger demographic 
as I've pointed out on the show a lot of times, I'm from that young generation, and I'm always interested in finding more people from the young generation who are interested in the esoteric, even if it is a secret fascination with the esoteric. Hopefully, Lauren, you won't abandon the esoteric, given its pithy standing in mainstream culture. It's tough to uh, open up to people and tell them that you're down with the esoteric, and it's very difficult at times, and I appreciate that you want to keep the whole thing kind of secretive. But there's a lot of ways to explore the esoteric and still maintain your own personal anonymity. There's various places on the internet where you can go and chat and post and exchange ideas on the esoteric, and if you ever find that you're ready to open up and ditch that secrecy, there's always local groups in the area that you can meet and discuss the esoteric with. Just, you know, do some web searching. I'm sure you'll be able to find something. But definitely stick around with the esoteric. It's only going to get more fascinating from here, and those of us who are part of the young generation are, I think, going to see quite a show unfold. So thank you once again for writing, Lauren. I really appreciate it. If you would like to have your email featured on Ben All of America Audio listener feedback, simply write to boaaudio at hotmail.com, boaaudio, all one word, at hotmail.com, or go to benallofamerica.com and click contact in the top right-hand corner, and that will put you on the road to having your email read here on Ben All of America Audio listener feedback. Wrapping up the show now, I want to thank Leslie, Chiron, R. Lee, Joe V., and Ralph Molesworth of BenallofAmerica.com for your help and support with the audio series and the website. All of them are great folks. They've just done a tremendous job in helping me put together this show, put together the website, and continually putting out top-notch reading material for the visitors of BenallofAmerica.com. BenAllOfAmerica.com, make it a part of your everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. If you're a long-time Benall of America audio listener or an appreciative newcomer and you want to help support the audio series and the website, click the PayPal button at BenAllOfAmerica.com. Tis the holiday season. Now's the time to make a donation. Help us pay the bills, offset the costs, and pay down some of the expenses that come along with a show like this. I pay for them out of pocket with help from Ben All of America audio listeners. Are you going to be one of those listeners that helps? That's up to you. Here's how you can be one. Go to BenAllOfAmerica.com, click the PayPal button, make a donation. No donation is too small. Every little bit helps, and all of them go towards helping keep Ben All of America audio up and running and available for our ever-growing listenership. Next week on Banal of America Audio, it is the UFO Crash Retrieval Conference 4 special. You're going to be hearing on-site interviews from the big festivities. Richard Dolan, Nick Redfern, Paul Shatskin, Michael Sala, Matthew Toomey. I talked to them at the UFO Crash Retrieval Conference. We're going to have those on-site interviews for you next week on Banal of America Audio. It's definitely different from our normal stuff. I think you'll enjoy it. It's pretty interesting. We cover a ton of different topics. And also, I will be discussing the conference. I'm going to be going over my report a little bit and also sharing some new stories from the conference that I haven't had a chance to tell yet. That's next week. Been all of America Audio's UFO Crash Retrieval Conference special. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. You'll be hearing from me next week with more Been all of America Audio. Until then, this is Tim Benall, signing off.